So five years ago, a manuscript from an unknown 23-year-old debut author landed in my inbox, and it was one of the best first novels I'd ever read. Go on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that book was Red Rising, and that unbelievably talented author is sitting right next to me today. Five years later, <laughs> Pierce Brown has as many laurels as his hero, Darrow. Three New York Times bestsellers, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Morning Star. Yeah. Over one million books sold, and, and another trilogy beginning with Iron Gold in January. Which, to be honest, is a big thank you to you guys. I mean, uh, especially the, everyone who pre-ordered Morning Star, because that was something that really helped uh, put it over the edge. So thank you so much, because I know it's a weird thing pre-ordering a book so many months out, but it was an amazing experience getting to share that with my family and friends, and also getting to do the announcement here in New York that we were doing Iron Gold. Uh, so it was really fun to see a lot of you at the Barnes & Noble event that we had uh, two years ago now, I guess. So I, I know a lot of you guys are excited about Iron Gold, so we're going to start off by talking about that a little bit. And at the end of the panel, we'll actually have a special sneak preview of Iron Gold for you. Um, so Morningstar wrapped up the first Red Rising trilogy, mm -hmm. and Iron Gold is the beginning of a new trilogy set in the same world. So set us up. Where are we? What's happening in your, in your universe as Iron Gold opens? So, okay, like most of you, I... I uh, have a mixed feelings a lot of times when one of my favorite series or a uh, movie that I like does a sequel, and sometimes it feels unnecessary. Sometimes it feels like they're doing it just in order to extend the universe for monetary reasons. And I wouldn't have come back to do another series of Red Rising if it didn't feel like a natural progression. And what really struck me with when I wrapped up Morning Star is that this is a universe full of shades of gray, right? And that's, I think, why I've been attracted to it, because there is no true evil villain, well, there are some, but uh, the, <laughs> the jackal notwithstanding. Um, there are some shade. they're mostly shades of gray throughout the series, so it felt as though when I ended it, it ended it on a note that was leaving, that left too much to the imagination to just leave you guys hanging. And so it felt almost true to the series to continue it, to show what happens after an empire crumbles, and to show the power vacuum that's created, and to see if Cavax, if Augustus, if Lorne, all these characters who warned against anarchy and against the idea of democracy were right. And to see how Darrow, Mustang, and the other heroes would come to grips or come to terms or battle against the chaos that follows the shattering of the uh, order that ruled before them. So anyway, Iron Gold takes uh, place 10 years later, and it follows these, it did follow those four protagonists. Um, and it really centers on the question of what happens after order is destroyed, what replaces it, and what happens in the power vacuum. Do the greedy, do the violent, do the power hungry succeed and then fill that vacuum? And can you maintain morality? Can you maintain you know, the, the white, white gloves, basically, in trying to keep peace if you're one of the good guys, or my definition of good guy? So it's fun to get to explore the character, see what Mustang does with power, see what Darrow does with power and to see if they become corrupt like the individuals who preceded them. So you mentioned that the story is told through the point of view of four characters. One of them is Darrow, which I know everyone in this room is excited that we're going to get to see more Darrow. So what's going on with him now that it's 10 years later? Drama, drama, drama. <laughs> uh, Darrow, you, know, you may not know this about Darrow, but he's a very emotional person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah, uh, prone, prone to, to, to fits of... Uh, uh, drama and depression. So Darrow has carried the rising for 10 years on his shoulders and has created the Republic, which is essentially, oh, I'm not going to ruin too many things, hopefully. Um, just start throwing things if it's too spoilery, but light things, not heavy things. Um, Darrow has carried the rising on his back for all this time, and what we see is that it's not necessarily the person he's wanted to be. You know, he thought in his mind that once he got to the top of the mountain, which means destroying the society, then he would finally have the peace that he always wanted. He'd finally get to be a father. So what I wanted to show in this and what we get to see is Darrow struggling with the identity of what he's had to take on as a reaper and then who he is as a man, who he is as a father, who he is as a partner to Mustang. And the dissonance between the roles that he's taken on in his life and the roles that he wants is very much akin to, I think, the dissonance I've had in my life, the roles that people expect me to take, the roles that I have to take in my, you know, to be personally happy. So he's a very fun character to write in this because 
I thought when I fini finished re writing Morning Star, I'd completed Darrow's arc. And then I see all the other nuances that you can explore with the character, the, 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 di the dichotomy of what he is as a human being. Because in the first line of the series is he would have lived in peace, but his enemies brought him war. And we get to explore that and wondering now, is he perpetuating the war? Is he, or does he have an identity outside of the war? And it's really a challenge to get to explore that, particularly uh, from one person's perspective. So that's why I had to bring the three other characters into the story to see how they think of Darrow, to see how the war that he perpetuates affects their lives, and not just affects their lives, but the lives of the people around them, and all the lives that get shattered when gi you know, under the feet of giants when giants battle. Okay, so on this rotating slideshow, you will see some images of the three other characters that appear in Iron Gold. Um, so Pierce, will you introduce us to our other narrators? Actually, how about you choose your favorite? My favorite, you know, it's Lysander. Lysander, yeah, you, you got a crush on Lysander. I do, um, I totally do. <laughs> Lysander is a is the grandson of Octavia Alun. You might remember him as being kind of a spunky nine, ten year old in the original series. And Darrow, he he grew up with Darrow as his hero because as the son, heir of the sovereign, he had access to the institute files, the tapes that no other one else was allowed to have, um, because most kids are kept in the dark about what the institute is because the natural progression of the passage and what they have to go through in order to become peerless guard. But Lysander has a little bit of a cheat uh, in that his grandmother shows him that, and he chose Darrow out of all of the picks from Mars Institute, because Martians are famous for being warlords, and so he wanted to build, his grandmother wanted him to build his own house around him, because she had the Fury, she had the Ash Lord, and what he, she wanted him to do is start creating his own center of power. And to do that, his first choice, you know, his first knight who was supposed to serve with him was Darrow. Unfortunately, he had a pretty shitty selection. <laughs> <laughs> or just really good taste. Um, so Lysander was raised in this world where he was expected to inherit the power. And now he's in a world where he's been disenfranchised of power. He's been traveling with Cassius throughout the belt and trying to live by the code that Cassius now lives by, which is very similar to the code Lorna Arcos would live by. And Cassius, I'm sorry, uh, Lysander is torn between does he follow the heritage of House Loon? Does he follow the heritage of House Arcos? And Lauren is his grandfather, his son. I mean, his dad was uh, one of Lauren's sons. Or does he pave his own path? And he's also torn because Cassius was obviously, obviously instrumental in the defeat of his grandmother. And so does he carry that animosity against Cassius? Or is the bond and the kinship that he has with him as a brother, as a uh, paternal figure, stronger than that? Because he did save him from Severo when they were leaving Luna. And so you'll see that a lot of these characters are at war with themselves, because I think that's what makes an interesting character, a character that's torn between the person they, who they are, who they want to be, who they think they are, and who they should be. And so with Lysander, you see the same struggle, or the same you know, a struggle of identity that Darrow has. Well, I, mean, I love Lysander, but a lot of our early readers have really fallen in love with Lyria. Lyria, yeah, Lyria was fun. It was also fun to get the channel the voice of a 16-year-old girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it beca mostly because I find her to be the most spiritually resonant person um, that I've gotten to write. Even So I wrote six books before Red Rising, and none of them were good, but uh, as stands testament that Red Rising is the first one I got published. But Lyria's voice reminds me a lot of that early pureness in my writing, and when I was writing just for myself, when I was writing without thinking anyone else was ever going to read it, except for maybe my mom, but even she pretended. Um, it's a funny story. One time I was with my mom, I, I show up in my, my first book, it's this like 800 page epic fantasy. And I give it to my mom and I say, Mom, look what I've done. And she sa says, that's amazing, what is it? And so I tell her it's a book and ask her to read it. And so about a month goes by, I've heard nothing, just crickets. And so I, I go to my mom and I say, did you read the book? And she says, yes, honey, it was wonderful. I'm like, who's your favorite character? And she says, oh, I don't know, I just love them all so much. <laughs> If you are a writer, you know what that, that means. Right. So then, I was not pleased with this, so I said, Averian was clearly the best character, right? And she says, Averian was by far my favorite. And I said, that's not a character in the book, Mom. <laughs> so besides my mother being mildly deceitful, um, where was I going with this? Sorry, I'm a wanderer. Um, where, where was I? Talking about uh, Lyria. Being yes, so Lyria. To Back to earlier. Lyria. Um, so Lyria, ha she has that innocence to her because she's from a mine, she's been um, brought out of the mines, as many of the Reds on Mars have been. And so what you see is this vast exodus, this diaspora of Reds from the mines. And they're going towards a life where they don't necessarily have a purpose, they don't have a place, they don't have a skill set. 
And so what I got to introduce is a lot of the real world headlines, essentially a people living in exile. And so I got to explore with Lyria this 16-year-old girl with a family trying to juggle her sense of identity of what she used or what the mine was. Her father was a, uh, a hell diver or a head talk for uh, her clan, which is a Gamma clan in Lagalos, her mind. And gammas are kind of the kieslings, the, the stool pigeons of the golds. They were always the ones who got the laurel, if you remember, and they were always the ones who were put above the rest. And so what you have then is racial animosity between the reds. And so even in her own assimilation camp, because they bring them up out of the camps in order to teach them new skill sets for their new place in the world, at least that's the idea, there's animosity against her people. So she feels the segregation even within her own color. And so what I get to explore with Lyria, and what you'll see with Lyria is her finding her identity within that situation, particularly when um, she's forced to take on a role that she never expected herself to take on. I'm trying to be really cryptic here. Um, and so with Lyria, you really have to, she is the small person in a room full of giants. I mean, Lysander is the heir of empire. Uh, Darrow is Darrow. And even, even Trigg, who I, well, I mean, sorry, Ephraim, who we'll get to in a second, is, is a mover and shaker in a, his own way. But she's a, a person who's been disenfranchised, has no power, and has to find her source of power. And particularly, she has to find her source of power when everyone else and all the instruments of society are conspiring to steal her power from her. So you, you talked a little bit about how Lyria is giving us a different look at the Reds. I, right. Ephraim is also giving us another look at the world of Red Yeah, Red yeah. Red Do you guys remember before. Trigg? Trigg T. Nakamura? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we got some, <laughs> he had a beautiful 20 pages. <laughs> yeah. So, you, uh, the last character is Ephraim, and Ephraim is the uh, fiance of Trig T. Nakamura, and he's a gray on Luna, and above, I don't want to give away too many details on him, but he used to, he was an ex-Legion uh, soldier, so all grays, uh, if they sign up to be in the Legion, serve 20 years, and then they go about their business, uh, usually contracting or working for companies. So he worked for an insurance company investigating art claims, basically. And so he joined the Rising shortly after Trigg died. And then what we see is Trigg ten year, or seven years after leaving the Rising. And we see him falling into the criminal world where he's become a freelancer. And freelancers, basically, in this Luna that's been ravaged by war, we have basically a huge uh, scrum to collect all the artwork and all the beautiful relics of their civilization. And so Trigg has fallen into the game of trying to become the richest man atop the, the, the pile. And so it's really fun to get to explore the underworld with Trigg and the, the, the syndicate, which is my version of the Black Sun from Star Wars. So when we were talking about Lyria, you mentioned that it was kind of a return, finding her voice is a return to your earlier writing. Um, what was it like going from writing just Darrow for three books to having to develop three more voices? Do the books have to be for three books? No, they don't. I was kidding. <laughs> you didn't hear me said those questions are okay to you. Never mind. Um, <laughs> let's see. The difference between writing Darrow and writing the other characters is, I guess, a game of nuance. I mean, Darrow is essentially a battering ram. And so what it's fun to see is Lysander's power comes from his intelligence. Lysander comes from words, from uh, basically knowing more stuff than the rest and then positioning people. Ephraim's power comes from experience. And then Lyria's power comes from uh, luck and ingenuity. And so it's much more fun and much, I guess, more interesting to me as a writer to explore the nuances and the relationships they have. Because unlike Darrow, Darrow has to manipulate everyone he meets. And so what you see is that these other characters, they get to form real bonds. They get to form things that Darrow was una unable to. And because of that, they either grow stronger or weaker or easier, more easily prone to deception. And so it was really a relief to not write Darrow for some. I actually wrote Darrow last. So I wrote each character all the way through. Starting with, was it Lysander? Lysander yeah. was first. So yeah. uh, Lysander first, and then Ephraim? Then Ephraim, then, then Lyria, Lyria, then, then Darrow. Darrow. Yeah. So I saved Darrow last because what I wanted to do was have the, the, the story defined by these other characters. I wanted their voices to inform Darrow so much because Darrow's the one they're all reacting off of, and I think that it would have made sense if I just did Darrow all the way through, but I didn't want it just to be Darrow's story. What I wanted to show is this, he might be the center of gravity in this world, but all these other characters are the ones who are helping shape this story. And so I saved Dara for last so I could capture each one of their voices. And so uh, each one had their own soundtrack, which made it a lot easier. Now, none had as distinctive a soundtrack as Severo, which is just Biggie and Tupac. <laughs> uh, so basically, I just steal a lot of street slang for Severo. But uh, having them each have their own nuances, having them each have their own 
diction and uh, dialectic is very fun, but also really challenging. So I really, really leaned on Trisha and uh, Delray, Delray in general to make sure that the voices differentiated themselves. Because Darrow's, the Red Rising writing style, as you know it, is Darrow's voice. It's not my writing style per se, it's Darrow's voice. So I get to, exp yes. Um, so I get to explore Darrow's, I, sorry, I get to explore the Red Rising world through Lysander's voice, through Lyria's voice, which is reflective of Darrow's to a degree because they're both born in the mines. But each mine is different, so they have their own different slang. But what's more important to me is that poeticism you see in Darrow's, it's like bum bum bar. So he does short, short, then long. Um, Lysander's sentence structure is very different. And in terms of how he sets up paragraphs is different as well. And so sometimes I was getting a little mad because <laughs> I was wondering if I was going insane as I was, especially when I was editing at the end. Um, but separating it out like that really helped me delineate the difference between the characters and also helped me see the world through their eyes. Yeah, it was cool to see their voices emerge with each draft, like especially like Lyria became. It took a couple like drafts though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like she became like sassier yeah, and like yeah. tougher with well, every, yeah, cause, uh, every draft. Yeah, Lyria started off as like kind of this pipsqueak, and then I just added a lot of lot of pepper to her. <laughs> um, so now now she's just like mace in the face, and it's great. <laughs> um, so when I'm at your signing, I love hearing your fans tell you which their favorite character is. Can you guys hear? I'm oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I love when I'm at Pierce's signings, um, his fans always tell him which their favorite characters are. So Pierce, who do you most often hear named, and do you yourself have a favorite? Well, it's really interesting. It's almost always Severo. But yeah. then I did a signing yesterday, and there was only two Severos in the entire signing line, or maybe there were four, and everyone else was either Darrow or Mustang, so I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> Who's your favorite character? Darrow. Okay, we're gonna do a show of hands. Okay. Taking me back to elementary school. Okay, Darrow's raise your hands. So underrepresented. <laughs> uh, Victor's raise your hands. <laughs> My style, Mike Braff. Uh, Mustangs raise your hands. All right, am I forgetting a character? Ragnar. Ragnar? <laughs> and is there one more character? How about the jackal? The jackal? Okay, psychopath, raise your hand. There's, <laughs> there's always one of you, yeah. All right, everyone back away from this guy. Yep. <laughs> you knew this about your friend, didn't you? Now you do, now you do. <laughs> There's no excuse. Um, so then I guess, finally, several raise your hands. Hey, Ragnar is actually pretty well represented. This is good. Yeah. All right, cool. I like that. Uh, so, uh, so there's Cassius contingent? All right, Cassius, raise your hand. No, you can't vote twice. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Cassius would vote to want to vote twice, too. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. It's a rigged system. I didn't even count. Who, who else voted twice? Um, <laughs> then I think, I mean, Aja, obviously. There's got to be a lot of fans. No? No? Uh, misunderstood woman. She was just doing her duty. It's OK. Roke? Roke. Ew. <laughs> Pax? Uh, oh, I forgot about him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Hold on, let me draw a name out of a hat. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, do you all know the hat story? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh some of y'all yeah. don't. Okay, prepare to dislike me a little bit. Um, so when I was trying to, okay, I wanted, I knew that I had to kill a character in that scene. So. <laughs> I was trying to show the capriciousness of war. I was trying to show uh, the jackal's capriciousness. And so I put all the names except for Darrow's in a hat. And I drew out Pax's name. And this is very late at night. And so I looked at the name and I'm like, wanting to put it back in. But I thought, you know, it's, that's dishonest. So I kept Pax and uh, gave him to the dogs or to the jackal. And so <laughs> this was very bad for me because I, the only thing I'd really brainstormed in the next one is that I wanted him to be Bash Brothers with, uh, with Ragnar. <laughs> so, and the, the, tele, and the whole shape of Golden Sun looked a lot different in my head because the Telemannuses were initially gonna be protecting Darrow. And without the Telemannuses protecting Darrow, he's really vulnerable to the Bolognas, right? And so because Pax's absence, I wasn't able to pursue that storyline. And so Golden Sun took shape without that along in it. And so it really did change everything, but I think it made it a little bit more kinetic, hopefully. Sorry about the death, yeah. <laughs> so but at that point, I didn't know he'd be that popular, so. <laughs> Speaking of killing characters without spoiling anything, how afraid should fans be for their favorite characters going into That's unfair. <laughs> that's like teasing out. Um, <laughs> like, very, but that's unfair, you know? <laughs> um, well, depending on the, the, the show of hands I saw, 
quite afraid, yeah. Be yeah. very afraid. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a Mickey fan, you're fine, but otherwise. <laughs> um, so in, in the process of developing Iron Gold, you and I have talked a lot about real historical events as a source of inspiration. How important is history to you overall as an inspiration for your work? Well, I think history is often way more interesting than the fiction we can create around it. If you look at history, I mean, it inspires some of the best works, uh, best incidents in fiction. Like uh, George R. R. Martin was inspired by a Scottish massacre for the Red Wedding. And I think that often in, okay, in books, there usually has to be a reason for something to happen. In history, very often you'll see that it is completely because one guy had a bad day that something happens. And a lot of times, sure, there's social influences, there's cultural influences, there are economic influences, but especially when you're dealing with Roman empires, especially when you're dealing with uh, small feudal states, it's a lot of times balanced upon the sanity of an individual or the goal of an individual. And that's what I think is so interesting about history, particularly f you know, feudal history, Middle Ages, uh, Roman history, uh, pre-Roman history, especially Greek history, because it's a lot of times influenced by the uh, I would say the gravitas or the actions of one person. And that's fascinating to me, and I draw a lot of inspiration for that, particularly the fall and decline of the Roman Empire. Um, by Gibbons, that book has been hugely influential. But then also, you know, I draw a lot from Greek plays, obviously, and I also draw a lot from the Peloponnesian War, from the first and second Persian invasion of Sparta, I'm sorry, of, uh, of Greece, and a lot of the wars that Rome fought, like the, um, Thrac or the Thracian War and the war against Mithridates, who's this Greek who tried to rebel against the Gro Roman Empire. So I find that often history can inform, but the problem with history sometimes is that there are so many characters that you have to find out where to boil it down to points of crisis for a book and to create the points of tension, the points of um, elevated action, and then you know ma match that basically to your, your plot, your emotional arc, et cetera. So you can't just take from history. You can be inspired from it, but you can't just replicate it. So when you wrote Red Rising, you were 23 and unpublished. Now you're writing Iron Gold several years later for a devoted audience, many excited fans. Um, so did, this, did that affect the writing of this book at all? Um, and what else was different about writing this book than your, writing your earlier books? Uh, I think at a certain point there is a, uh, like we're in this together feeling. And with book three, I really felt it. Because book two, I didn't, when I was writing it, it was before Red Rising came out. And so there wasn't really an audience, and there weren't really readers. But I feel as soon as I hand that book over to the first person, it starts becoming a shared world. I mean, sure, I, I'm the landlord, but you guys are paying rent uh, to live in that world. And I think that there's this, because you, you spend your time, you spend your energy, you spend uh, your love sharing the book. And because of that, I feel as though I can't create in a vacuum, because that's unfair. So if I'm just creating for myself, then I don't think that it, to be honest, would take the shape that I would be as proud of because I like being informed by the opinions. I like being informed by who the favorite characters are. I like being informed by what resonates and what doesn't resonate. And also what has, is problematic. You know, with things that uh, don't ring true. Particularly that. So if something doesn't resonate or if you feel like I cheated you on a character's evolution or something, I think it's very good to know that because while it might not, you know, be the be all end all decider of how I write the next book, it definitely informs it because I really do feel as though we're all on this adventure together, and it's fun to get to see how it ends, but it's also fun to know that you know, your love of it, your influence on it can help shift and change the world. And I think that the best tool that any writer has is the imagination of the reader. You, know, you can imagine a world when you're reading far better than I can when I'm writing one because I see all the cracks. I see the fissures in the big statue in the big uh, world of Red Rising. And then it can be seamless and budgetless you know, when it's in your brains. And so I think that with Iron Gold, more than any of the other books, I've, I've felt that. And my responsibility is not to be s simply uh, going for fan favorite moments. You know, like I think that there are certain series that have started reading their own blogs too much, and then they'll have <laughs> awesome moments that aren't backed up by the story at all. And the character evolution, or you know, two characters meeting, and then they behave in a way that's antithetical to the character that they built up over five seasons or six seasons, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're an expert at something just because it's cool. <laughs> and I think that that's something you really have to resist is trying to telegraph those fan moments uh, because a lot of times they come when you're sacrificing the, I guess, consistency and truth of the story. 
Sorry, I brambled a lot. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Well, let's go, go back a little bit further to your origin story. Have you always wanted to be a writer, and what was the moment you realized it was what you most wanted to do? <laughs> I was waiting for Dance of the Dragons um, <laughs> when I decided to be a writer. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Uh, I read, uh, dance, I read uh, Feast for Crows, and then I was in my room in Dallas, and I had almost graduated high school. And I, when I finished, well, I got, I didn't finish Wheel of Time, but I was done with it. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and very important yeah, it's a very experience. big distinction. I went up to, a, I went up to like ten or eleven. Yeah, I was, okay, yeah, you, yeah. I had maybe. some, devic, uh, you know, yeah. I, I saw Avienda pull that braid twenty thousand times. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> great series, though. Check it out. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you have ten thousand hours. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, so yeah, I, I, I stumbled onto writing because I wanted. I basically wasn't. I wasn't doing fan fiction. It was, I was just writing, a st I wrote a story about a dragon getting killed in a field by a couple mercenaries, and then that started ballooning out into this 800-page epic, and then I moved to Seattle a couple weeks later where I had absolutely zero friends and was watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, it was like when Netflix was new, so I was like, I was like shit, I can, I can pay like 15 bucks and get 20 DVDs if I plan it out right, so I was getting Buffy all the time. <laughs> and it was rather lonely with Buffy and Angel, and I was terribly distraught at the end of season two. But besides that, Spike <laughs> healed that <laughs> hole in my heart. Um, and so I was basically writing eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, because I was preparing to go to college, and I was able to really throw myself into for two months, because my parents were nice enough to let me live with them rent free. And so I poured myself into writing for two months, and then it kind of got hooked. And I only had one friend who read my stuff. Uh, and we all, we liked the same things, and I think he's smarter than I am. But he's not a writer, which is great. So he didn't have to compete, because he has this very lawyerly academic brain. Um, trouble relating to humans, though. But um, really bright guy. <laughs> and he would read all my stuff. And it was amazing to have one person. And if you are a writer, if you are an aspiring artist, I, I would counsel you to find one person who you're not competitive with, who you trust absolutely, both their intelligence and their taste. I know that narrows the field quite a bit, <laughs> but I think a lot of times the problem comes when you're a writer or an or a artist or a musician, and you ask for someone who, someone's opinion who's usually a family member or a friend, and they don't like that type of music or that type of book. So what are you expecting from them? You're expecting some form of catharsis, right? You're expecting some form of validation, but whatever they give you, it's not going to be enough, and you're going to feel weirder and less confident about your work. So the key is to find someone who can understand what you're trying to do. And so I found that person, and he really helped inspire me to write six more books before I finally got published. And it was really because we were sharing our own little worlds. It's the same reason I like talking with uh, readers about Red Rising. It's because sharing it with him made it feel more real. It made me feel not alone, which is a lot of times you can feel like you're trapped in your own echo chamber when you're a writer. And you can never discern whether or not you're good or bad. Well, you just assume you're bad. Well, you start thinking you're good, then you read it again. Um, and I think that the only thing that kept me going is essentially finding those people. Then I found three people, then four people, and then gradually I found Del Rey, and that was, you know, the experience of a lifetime. So, um, what's been the most exciting part about this wild journey you've been on? Sitting up here with you, Tricia. Of course it's it is. It's just lovely. <laughs> uh, probably most exciting is, I mean, it's really fun seeing cosplayers. Um, it's delightful. I mean, I saw a uh, brother and sister who were playing uh, the Jackal and uh, Mustang. And that was fantastic. Uh, also, it's really fun uh, just actually talking and connecting with people when they surprise me with a comment or surprise me and find something that I wanted to portray in Red Rising, but I didn't think anyone noticed. And a lot of the time, it, I did this four years ago, you know, in my, well, above my parents' garage and then uh, in my office. And it's in these solitary moments when you realize that it's a communal moment. That's a fun thing, is because you're getting to share a part of yourself, a little fragment of yourself that you put in something. And when someone recognizes it, then all of a sudden you feel like they, s they see all of you. And that's a really fun thing. So you've also been working on another cool project. It's very dear to your heart. You have a story in the Star Wars anthology. I do. From a certain point of view. I'm a view. Star Wars author. You're a star you're does that count if you write like eight pages? Yes. It does, right? You are yeah. totally a Star Wars writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had the panel <laughs> earlier. So you're a huge Star Wars fan. What was it like? So I did, uh, yeah, it was great. I got yeah. to do the story of Biggs Darklighter. Um, so you guys this, this like anthology um, retells the story of A New Hope from the point of view of secondary. Yeah, so it's, it's 40 yeah. chapters, uh, and it's a different perspective every chapter. So I got to do the Biggs attack on the Death Star. So we're seeing it from Biggs's point of view. He's one of the wingmen. 
And I was actually kind of miffed because I wanted the, I mean, the eventual title of the chapter was uh, Desert Sun. I am upset though because I, I initially petitioned for it to be the last mustache ride. And for, <laughs> for some reason, they nixed that. Um, Biggs has a mustache if you didn't know that. Um, but it was fun getting to play in the sandbo sandbox of Star Wars. Um, but I kept accidentally writing Rip Wing instead of X-Wing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier that Star Wars is a big influence on the Red Rising series. What did you learn about storytelling from Star Wars? Um, that science doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great. Thank God they invented the Hoofy-Doo device. Yeah, yeah, it's Star amazing. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, think about it. Think about it. There's yeah. stormtroopers that are tracking the droids, right? And they have scout bikes that we see later on, you know, in, in the episode six. But this one guy's riding a lizard. A and I'm like, that's gotta be vastly inefficient. Like, how did he get lizard <laughs> duty? Like, does he have to muck the lizard stall? They, they can destroy planets and he's riding a lizard, a iguana. It's a dewback, technically, if you're gonna <laughs> ask me about it. But um, from Star Wars, I, I think that it's the blending of, the blending of space and, and, and mythology. You know, my favorite stuff is Star Wars and Dune. And it's my favorite because what it does is it creates science fantasy. It's this uh, mythological construct and it creates a world bigger than the one we know. It creates this whole mythology which didn't exist. And that is fun because of the themes you get to play with. Because you're seeing essentially human beings thrown into the world of gods and then they become gods. Like Luke Skywalker is essentially, you know, uh, in the Star Wars universe as close as you would come to a god. Same with Darth Vader. And so you get to see these battles of giants. And I think that's what I took away the most is finding characters who start relatable or are relatable and then imbuing them with the power that is beyond our reckoning. I think it's the same reason you know, people like superheroes. It's this person whose emotions are much like yours but are dealing with it on a vaster scale. And being able to see emotions blown up like that, particularly when there's spaceships doing pew, 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 is really fun. <laughs> um, so a couple of like dorky process questions. Sure. Um, your series has a really unique slang system? Mm. So how did you mm. come up with that? So Mama Brown, my mama, she hates being called Mama Brown because it's what my, mo my dad's mom was called. So whenever I call her Mama Brown, it's kind of like a passive aggressive thing. Um, <laughs> but mom, it also reminds me of Mama Bear from Berenstain Bears, which I think is cute and she thinks is less than flattering. <laughs> they don't have, well, I mean, they, there's one outfit that is a very similar fashion sense, but otherwise, <laughs> otherwise my mother is not like a bear. Um, oh God, this is being videotaped. <laughs> Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> so my mom would not let me swear as a kid. Well, my, okay, my dad would, you know, he was all into the, uh, the pretty strict, pretty strict punishment. I mean, one year he outlawed Halloween because he thought it was, you know, devil worship. And then the next year he was over that and it wasn't devil worship anymore and he dressed up. So I don't know if there was terrible consistency, but uh, my dad was, you know, I wasn't allowed to swear at all. But uh, my mom used the, a more cunning argument on me. She said that swearing is the sign of a low intellect because it means you can't choose another word and you have to resort to that word. And I was like, ugh, that's, well, shit bag, that's hard. <laughs> so if you use a compound word, you have to integrate the two. You're essentially using your vocabulary, creating your own, and expressing distaste for the system. It's great. <laughs> so uh, that's where Severus the whole diatribe comes from, yeah. And one of my favorite things about exposing people to this series is they immediately I like start it. It using really the slang. Yeah, it is also gotten, exposing them to the series. I've yeah. gotten so many emails like, this book was so bloody damn good. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, that's probably my favorite thing is when someone comes up to me and says that. It tickles yeah. me pink. It's great. <laughs> that's a Red Rising pun. <laughs> so like building this, this, this slang is part of all the world building you've done in creating mm -hmm. the universe of Red Rising. Yeah, and to be honest, yeah. I don't know really where it came from. I just started yeah, writing it's, it's the, like well, I didn't even have the world. I just started writing the Red Rising, I'm right. sorry, the chapters in the mine. And then the world kind of formed around it, I suppose. But, you know, it started with the idea of, I, mean, I was reading a history book. I mean, I was reading Antigone, but I was also reading a little bit before that, uh, the plight of the Irish immigrants who came over to the United States in the 18th uh, and uh, late 18th and early 19th century, and they were a migrant workforce for industrialism, essentially. And so I looked at the Reds as being that migrant workforce. And so a lot of the slang initially spawned from that. Um, and then that you know other cute anecdote about my mom, that one, yeah. <laughs> well, do you find a lot of your world building grows out of the story as you're writing it, or do you spend a lot of time making maps and? 
Well, it's really hard to make a map of the Red Rising world because yeah. everything is, I mean, if it was like, if it was, I, I love building maps. I love building fantasy maps. I used to always do that before stories. I have so many maps that I, I constructed e without even stories attached to them. But the difficulty of Red Rising is not a two-dimensional map that you can ever do because you're creating, you know, you have a terraformed globe, but you have not just one. No, no. You have like 25 habitable ones. <laughs> so do you create maps of all of them? And how do you create maps out of all of them? And I don't have the 3D, well, I do have the 3D software, but it's really time consuming, so I don't do it. Um, but overall, I'd have a con I have, I started off after I did the first chapters of Red Rising, creating a list of all of the technology by basically pillaging the DARPA website. And I was looking at, like that's where razors came from. Razors come from the idea of creating uh, magnetism in non-metallic objects. Um, and yeah, so I thought it was super cool. And so a lot of the technology comes from there, but the worlds themselves, I build maps of things like the Citadel of Light on Luna. I build maps of Hyperion, or I build maps of like what the mine looks like. But a lot of that is for myself in order to understand where my characters are occupying the physical space so I can see how an action scene would take place, so I can see how the movement would be m difficult to go from place to place, and it creates a sense of size. Because I think it's a lot of times very difficult to remember that how one human being would look when fired at the bridge of the Pax, for instance, or the Colossus before it became the Pax. You know, we're talking about a human being being launched at a, you know, a 7.3 kilometer long ship. And so keeping that scale and sometimes just dr like putting down a little tick of uh, pencil on like a big sheet of paper is great to help me or remind me of the proportion of mass that I'm talking about, which makes it easier to write. It also makes me realize how the characters would feel. So sometimes. Right, and it goes back to what you were saying before about keeping it honest, not cheating to make the plot yeah, more yeah, convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that what the funny thing is, I'll, I'll do inconsistent world building. So I'll have this huge chronology of events for a city, or I'll have you know, the rationale behind the terraforming of, say, um, Io or, or Venus, and then my, my editor will tell me, yeah, that's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, God, that was, that was a day and a half <laughs> of coffee but it's and important agony. That you know that. Sure, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what you say to make me not cry. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a lot of deleted scenes. It's basically just like my, uh, my uh, Rick, Rick, Rick Steves, yeah, my Rick Steves of, of, of Darrow's world. <laughs> Well, Is um, it Rick Steves? Rick Steves. Yeah, yeah Rick, Rick Steves. Steves. Rick yeah. Steves. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, a couple of weeks ago, you had a very cool announcement for your fans. So tell us a little bit about HowlerFest. Oh, HowlerFest, yeah. Uh, HowlerFest, for those of you who do not know, is an event we are doing to launch Iron Gold in California, in Los Angeles. I know, it's where I live, sorry. <laughs> um, and so we're doing it, we're having one of my friend's bands come, we're having uh, Q&A sessions, tattoo artists, what else are we having? Delightful things. Delightful things, wonders. Wonders, what's wonders? Wonders, you. Oh, me, I'm a wonder. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> wonders, uh, we're having fan art contests where we're showing the, right. uh, the, the best. Uh, it'll be a gallery of fan art. Oh, okay, yes. yeah. Um, so we're having gallery fan art, we're having um, a, another session like this where I'll be much more charismatic and charming. <laughs> and then we are also having a celebration of drinks and stuff like that. So basically it's a big kickoff because last time we did it at, uh, we did the launch at Book Soup, which was a, a fantastic, fantastic bookstore in LA. But we had people crammed in kind of like, like uh, I don't know, like, like crabs in a basket. Yeah. Um, don't know why I chose that, maybe I'm hungry. Um, but anyway, we had a lot of people piled in, and what we wanted to do was something that is actually kind of a celebration of the fans as much as it is of the launch, because the launch is over so quick and it's basically a huge signing line, in, which is really fun, but I don't get to spend much time with you individually. And so what would be more fun with this event is actually getting to mingle and talk, and so we can do Q&A within groups of like, you know, three or four, as opposed to just sitting up here on a microphone, because what I want is that personal interaction. And also, as I said, the most important thing for me is, the, is how this has grown as a community. And how, to be honest, the groups that are online, the uh, Howlers on Facebook and on uh, other form, or like Tumblr, all get along so well. And it would be fun to see them finally mingle and see if that happens in the flesh or if we're going to have a huge passage. So you should show up. <laughs> have some time for fan questions. Um, there's a microphone in the center of the aisle, so if you could make your way there and stand in line, um, we can take your questions. Well, you weren't timid before, come on. Yes. You gotta stand up, though. Yeah. And then dance. 
You got it. Yeah, hey. Uh, yeah. She, oh, she can just she project, can yeah. Project. Okay. Uh, what are you reading right now? Oh, uh, what am I reading right now? I'm reading Artemis by Andy Weir. Um, so I am a quarter of the way through that. I am also reading a book on the Vietnam War, and the name escapes my memory, uh, mostly because the rat war and the Vietnam War is very similar to the tunnel wars that were on Mars. Um, so I'm stealing as much as I can. It was flawless. It was just, 100 I mean, it was the Giselle Bujin of drafts. It was fantastic. <laughs> or Adrian Lima, I don't know what you like. You know, um, no, I'd say um, it was the least edited of all the drafts, I'd say. Um, Mike Braff, who was my editor for it during the initial process, could probably answer a lot more. And I think he would say that it needed a lot to work. But, it, hey, look at that. Uh, so it was the most, I guess, uh, raw, uh, and I think when you read it again, it has that earnestness and rawness to it, but it required a lot less work than Golden Sun did and Morning Star, mostly because it was self-contained. It was a novel that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, whereas Golden Sun is leading to the next book. It has to be a bridge. So Golden Sun was much more complicated to write, and then Morning Star infinitely more so than Golden Sun. And so because of that, it's allowed to have a purity because the world is smaller. Now, we allude to the bigger world in Red Rising, but I don't have to explore it, and because of that, it allows me a lot more freedom to take you know, uh, detours um, because everything else is so tight. So I'd say there was probably the slickest of the, of the three drafts, and then uh, progressively they've gotten more complicated. So how many drafts did you go through it before it came to us? Oh, so my agent, yeah. Hannah, uh, Hannah Bowman, was really influential in shaping the initial draft, and so she did a lot of editing on it as well. So I, had, I just had oodles of battles at the Institute because I like oodles of battles. And there were just a lot of pointless conflicts that was fun for me from a military perspective because I was basically going Lord of the Flies on it. And they were completely unnecessary for the story. And so we, we took out, I'd say, about a good 60 pages of additional material that was in there. Would you consider writing other novels that don't necessarily further the story or maybe flesh out some of the fiction, like The Darker Walls, uh, The Original Conquering, The Burning of Judea? Uh, they'd be all pretty interesting to do. I think that I have a lot of other stuff I want to explore as well outside the Red Rising world. But nothing's off limits because there is such resonance to Lauren's character. He really interests me. Uh, the Ash Lord as well. I think that you see a lot of parallels between the Ash Lord, Lauren, Octavia, and Darrow, Cassius, and uh, Mustang. And so seeing what kind of man the Ash Lord wanted to be and the type of man he had to become would be very interesting. Same with Severo. It would be fun to get to challenge his voice, or channel his voice for an entire book. I might come out of it <laughs> with a little bit of psychosis, but it could be fun. I would have cheated. I would have just been like, Broop. oh, it's a, I would have been like, I can't read this. My cursive is so bad. And, uh, <laughs> gosh, I got to write this in print. Uh, that would have been that would have been really hard. I mean, I, her name was in there, but I really do think I would have cheated at that point because that was kind of that would have been bullshit. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have written, you know. <laughs> Almost all. So this is, this, is, this is the challenge of me doing outlines. So outlines are difficult for me because I find so much inspiration in the moment. And the way I look at it is when you're doing an outline, you have you know, a couple weeks of doing it, and you have several moments of epiphanies throughout that outline. And when you're writing, you have 100 epiphanies or 1,000 epiphanies. You can have an epiphany on each page. It's epiphany central. But I say there's a lot of epiphanies. But you can have characters like Tactus then who I never expected to jump off the page the way he did. He was supposed to be kind of a one and done, just a, kind of an outlier in Darrow's army, just to show you the golds aren't all good. And instead, I get to develop this character who becomes one of my favorites and has one of the best arcs in my mind through the series. Unfortunately, it ended in a way that we didn't expect or maybe didn't hope for, but he jumped off the page for me. Uh, Severo. Severo was never intended to be that prolific in the story. I, he was never meant to be that big of a character. Um, uh, who else? Uh, let's see. 
Um, Victra, Victra as well. And so those were all ones that surprised me. You know, Victra being the most trustworthy person, I never expected that. And I think that that was very interesting for me to write and explore, particularly when in Golden Sun, she's on the ground crawling towards Darrow and saying, I did, it wasn't me, I didn't know. And I never would have expected those words to come out of the mouth of the woman who began the book. And sh the fun thing is they get to ex change for me too, and I get to see, and, and to be honest, I wish I was smarter. Like I wish I could see the whole path of a character. I wish I could see the three-dimensionality of a character throughout the entire, uh, the entirety of their arc, and throughout, like, I wish I could see them as a person. Unfortunately, they start sometimes two-dimensionally in my brain. They start almost like in the role I want them to have in the D&D dungeon raid squad, you know? Like I want my warlock or I want my, my, my rogue. And then they morph. And as I begin writing them, I start thinking, well, how would they react to this situation? What are they wanting? And when, you ha when you're writing a character, the most important thing you can write is what do they think they want and what do they actually want? And so getting to explore that with Victoro, with Tactus, was really fun and were, you know, a uh, complicated experience. And that's why my favorite draft is usually the third or the fourth one on a book, because I've gotten to explore all the alternatives. Because a lot of times I'll write them and be like, that's flat, or my editors will say, this character is just not resonating, why do they exist? And so then I will have to do a quirk, and it's usually something that is unexpected, but feels inevitable, and that's when you have a real character. Wait, wait, can you start over? <laughs> I'm just. Well, first off, who's forcing me? <laughs> um, I would say, this is, this is dearly unfair. Uh, I would keep Lorne alive. I'd keep Lorne alive because I want to see him against Darrow. Because uh, that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if the fanfic you like doesn't really jive to that. Uh, Darrow would get killed by Lorne, so he had to die. Uh, so the Jackal actually did a good one for, for Darrow. I would say then the characters that I would, would kill? Hmm. Oh, Ugly Dan, he's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> that receding hairline has to go. I think that the, let's see, Darrow, Darrow coming out of the mines, for instance, he, he started from this um, rather heteronormative, misogynist culture because the golds deprive the women of leadership positions within their society because they don't let them do the most dangerous task, which is hell diving, which is where all the leaders of the Red Society comes from. Now, that was something that evolved over the course through critiques, through talking with people and seeing how nuanced I can make that is seeing that not being, I mean, it being Darrow as a 16 year old's perspective and then how he can mature and see other women in the book in places of power. You know, Mustang, the Octavia, some of his greatest adversaries become women, but he initially started off in a position where he thought all the leaders were men. And I think that that was something that was really informed by my interaction with the fans, uh, my interaction with the material itself and it evolved over the time as I grew up too. And so I think Darrow starting from this place of saying cry like a girl and in book, by book three, he would never say that. If anything, it's cry like, cry like Darrow. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, yeah, it's really intimate because there's some real bad music on there. <laughs> <laughs> like there's some real cheesy shit. I don't know if I want you guys to think I listen to. Um, I just find Taylor Swift so inspiring. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, no, that that didn't happen. That did happen. Uh, there's one song she did the one song for the Hungry Games that made it onto the playlist. I forget what that song was. Safe and Sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Severo's song, of course. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I think I, I think I would. I would have to definitely tailor it so I look more sophisticated, though, for sure. <laughs> you will look for a while.
Well, the divergence is in how different they are. She doesn't get a cheat code. She doesn't get put into a God of War body. And I think that that is the main difference between the two of them, because both of them are plucky in their own way, um, because they'd be you know, stifling characters if they weren't, because it's like, oppression, oppression, yeah. You know, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> 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 but I, wanted, I want to see the difference, and I think the similarities between them is so fun and fascinating and fun, I mean, great to explore. I mean, Lysander, to be honest, is also quite like Darrow. He had his world destroyed by another type of person. Everything ripped away. And so how do these human beings react differently, given us a different set of circumstances? And also, having a different set of people who inspired them. Lysander never had an EO. You know, Lysander also never had a complicated person who was like EO. You know, initially, obviously, Darrow worshipped his wife, and then you saw the gradual uh, dissolution of that worship. And so with Lysander, with, with Lyria, the fun thing is getting to explore how they react to adversity or how they react to similar circumstances. But I think what made Lyria so interesting as a character is there were no options to do what Darrow did. And for me as a writer, there were no options to repeat the same story. And that can be really wonderful because you're really forcing yourself to evolve and making the character have their own voice and operate on a totally different level. So we get to see more of the world through Lyria because of that. And we get to explore more of it because she can't just invade a starship. It's a complicated process. And you usually have to be seven feet tall and have a psycho sidekick. You know? <laughs> So initially it was sold to Universal in 2014 uh, with Mark Forrester set to direct and so I penned a couple of the scripts for it and then uh, I am working on um, giving you an update soon. I, I can't say much because I'll put my foot in my mouth and then I'll get called out on it. So there's, there's more news on that coming. Um, but <laughs> you just keep digging, don't you? <laughs> Now, yeah, I, I want it to be as violent as possible because what's really, okay, what's really sometimes missing from like Star Wars to me is the idea of metal and men and how frail human beings are in this world of flashing metal and careening ships and danger. And I think a big part of the Red Rising world is how terrifying the violence is and seeing someone like Aja mow through nine guys would be very different experience if it was done in a PG-13 fashion, as opposed to seeing it done like how the mountain killed his horse. You know, there's just a very different visceral reaction. What I want from the series is the violence to be startling, for the violence to be seen as a tool, as something that people use to impose their will. And I think that's huge in the Red Rising series because power is essentially defined by people who can wield violence most effectively in the initial three books. And if the violence isn't felt, I feel like you rob a great part of the story away. How much does a Porsche cost? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, think, I think it's hard because a lot of it's half-baked and it's shorthand, so I know what it means sometimes. <laughs> and sharing it, okay, there's a big thing because I want to share. I love, see, I love showing the world. I love seeing, showing you how it came about because it, it's just fun. Yeah, I get kicks out of it. But it's also a double-edged sword because I don't want it to ruin the experience and destroy the myth for you to see the cracks between it, you know what I mean? Like, um, there's a fantasy that exists perfectly in your mind when you read a book, and if you see ch chapters that didn't get in there, and you see why, I don't want you seeing why. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, that is a bad choice. So it's a lot of times you have to decide between uh, full transparency, like, do you really want to know how your government works, you know? Or do you want it just to work? I mean, that's probably a bad comparison. <laughs> I want it all for there, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah, I think that there are, I, I think that the best scenario for me would eventually be doing uh, what they do for the Star Wars universe or the Game of Thrones universe. It's the maps of Westeros that are so fun. You know, I grew up on the glossaries of Star Wars and the weapons and the planets and the uh, characters, all those like really cool big books. I love that stuff. 
And so that would be really fun to do, especially after Iron Gold, which fleshes out a lot of that and just explores more. I mean, I'd love books on the neighborhoods in Luna and showing you the backstory of the bazaars or, or of Old Town. And so that would be fun for me, but I think that I have to really build out the story first and then it has to support it. The Jackal is a character? Um, me in high school, man. No, I'm kidding. No, that's weird. Um, actually, one of my old high school friends is here, so he would vouch for that not being true. Uh, I, would, I hope. Um, I would say that the Jackal, I look as a good, at a good villain being the inverse of the hero. And so I think the best villain I know is the Joker. And so he's the universe of Batman, both in terms of his philosophy and on, in where his power comes from. And so I wanted the Jackal to be the same as the inverse of Darrow. And so to be honest, the Jackal couldn't exist without Darrow because he needs that foil and Darrow couldn't exist without the Jackal in that the first series. So he really did come out of the vacuum that Darrow occupied. Plus, I think that in a world that's defined by the physical prowess of people, it's very, very scary to see someone thriving who is not physically powerful because you're wondering what the secrets are. It's like the, the monster in the movie. It's not cool anymore. It's not scary anymore as soon as you see the monster. But the jackal, the monster, is always inside. You barely get to see it. And whatever you do see is just a glimpse. Like when you see Aja fight, that's her monster. That's her. Like she, her monster is her physicality. It's her violence. The jackal's monster is something you can never see. It's the demon inside. And so getting to see just the, that demon's actions is fun. And so I think that that's what made him fun to write, and I think that's what made him resonate to me and why he exists. I'll let you know when I manage it. <laughs> Very, I, the first drafts are the hardest for me, mostly because it's not necessarily self-critical. It's more indecisiveness, because you'll be walking down a path, writing, writing a path, and you'll say, oh, I could go 13 different ways. And then you'll start choosing one, and you're like, oh, crap, there's 13 other ways this could go. So it's deciding not which path to take, but what you think the best path to show your character will be. And so a lot of times you're wondering, am I showing the best version of this? And I think that's something that haunts a lot of writers. You'll have a story in your head, but how you show that story can a lot of times uh, leave doubt or you'll always think there's a room to improve. And that's why I think my drafts grow increasingly stronger and why, to be honest, I find my voice over the course of drafts right. is because I'm becoming more confident in those ideas. And so I'd say that the, the, both my editors have always espoused the mantra to me, just write, then we'll fix it up. <laughs> and that's very true. And Terry Brooks, who's kind of my mentor in writing, has said, trust the process. He says, just get that first draft out, because it's you're always going to be highly critical. And the reason you're a writer is because you're highly critical, because you look at other stories and you think, oh, I can do better, you know? And so I think when it comes from that place, you just have to sometimes write, forget the self-criticism, as hard as it can be, or just think, oh, this sucks, especially if you write something at night and you read it in the morning, because then it's going to really suck. Because you're, like, you're writing at night, you're like, I am a genius, I'm a madman, it is late at night, and I'm listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> and then you wake up in the morning like, oh my god, I was listening to Taylor Swift when I wrote this. <laughs> and then you'll see you weren't a genius. And so I think that a lot of it comes from the ability to decide, to the ability to discern between a sketch and the finished product. So what you're doing is a sketch at first, and then finished product, you know, you have less excuses. That's still hard to read, so I don't reread my stuff that much, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Lyria is pretty up there because <laughs> I just, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also just compared myself to a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> well, I mean. Which says a lot about my music taste, yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I used to, you know, cruise with the windows down. You know, it's fun time with my PSL. Um, that's pumpkin spice latte, people. <laughs> I have one per season. There's so much sugar in there, it gets me dizzy. But, um. <laughs> I would say, what was, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, that's hard. You know, I thought it was Darrow, but it's not. I think that the closest might be Mustang in a way, because she sees all these people behaving in ways that she sees as irrational, and they keep affecting her life, and she gets really annoyed by it. <laughs> And she's like, why can't you just be as logical as me? Everything would be fine. Just take my damn advice. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably Mustang, yeah. But Mustang's like built after my mom, so <laughs> it makes sense. And I'm, I'm very much my mother's son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mom, 
surprisingly, the Bernard Cornwell series of books. So Bernard Cornwell is like my favorite military, uh, not military, I'm sorry, historical fiction writer. And he has this fantastic series that now has a first season on BBC, which you know I'm not as big a fan of the show, but the books are fantastic. It follows Uhtred de Bebenburg, this English young man and noble in the eighth century, seventh, seventh or eighth century, who gets eighth century, ninth century, okay. Um, <laughs> That guy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, ninth century because it uh, focuses on him after he's taken in by Vikings, raised by Vikings, and focuses on the foundation of Britain through Alfred the Great. Yeah? Okay. Nailed it. <laughs> and so it's a really good series. Have you read the latest one? Death and the Hulk. Okay, awesome. Um, I had no doubt. Uh, <laughs> the, it's third, how many books? Uh-huh, four of you. <laughs> Victory is mine. <laughs> There's 12, right? Or most of them have to be 12. Awesome, so it's a great series. I mean, it follows, did you read uh, the, the Rifleman series? Uh, Sharp? Sharp? Sharp, yeah. I have the entire box. Oh, it's so good, yeah. Uh, so the Sharp series is also amazing. So I think it's fantastic because the Sharp series is a little bit more like James Bond in uh, 1812. I mean, it's the Napoleonic Wars. But the Uhtred Babenberg series is really fantastic because it follows this man with a struggle, you know, with a confused identity as he is trying to help establish England as a country. And so it's really fun to get to explore history that you've only really read about through the eyes of an individual. So that's great. And also, the ooh, uh, Dorothy Dunnett is a fantastic, uh, I read a lot of historical fiction, but Dorothy Dunnett has this book called Niccolo Rising, and it shows the birth, the birth and evolution of an, Itali of an Italian merchant family. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, Italian merchant family. Where? That's Dorothy Dunnett. Not done it, but done it. <laughs> no, D-U-N-N-E-T, yeah, 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 Niccolo Rising. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, but Pierce will be in the autographing area at 515, table 24, signing. Um, books will be for sale there, or you can bring books to be signed. Um, as you leave the room, I, my colleagues will have excerpt booklets with a special preview of Iron Gold. Um, and these um, beautiful pieces of artwork you've been seeing on the slideshow. If you pre-order Iron Gold at our booth this weekend, booth 2104D, you'll get a, uh, you'll get a beautiful print of those character images. Um, so thank you very much thank for you guys. joining us. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you, Pierre.